Welcome to the Master Course in High-End Blocking and Staging. Over the next six DVDs, our goal is to develop an all-inclusive language of camera work. In this entire course, we're blocking in 3D. 3D is really the ideal environment for experimenting with camera work because it brings a level of clarity to the blocking that we could never get from live action. And without having to wrestle with diagrams or storyboards, we immediately get to see the results of every technique. The green objects are cameras. Lock cameras simply hang in the air at lens position. Tracking and craning is shown with a rig, which we'll look at on Volume 3 and 4. In the animations, we'll see all cameras that are in a scene simultaneously, although it's rare to shoot more than one or two cameras at the same time. The camera with a green field of view is the active camera. As we cut to another camera, we're seeing that camera's field of view instead. Throughout the course, we're blocking with mannequins or models. Models are not just the most patient actors to work with, they're great for blocking because they're completely expressionless. As we work with camera moves and the body language between the characters, all emotional impact must be coming from the camera work and not from the actors. By separating the camera work from the acting performances, it becomes extremely clear how we attach thoughts and feelings to the characters and how integral camera work is to creating emotions on screen. This course is an ambitious undertaking that is created with the highest goals in mind. The course is based on the assumption that real mastery comes not from knowing a few hot moves, but from having a deep understanding of every single technique. So what we'll try to do over the next six volumes is break down camera work into as simple components as possible and then put it all back together. The difficulty in making a course like this is that everybody knows different techniques, so in this course we'll attempt to cover literally everything there is to know about camera work from the ground up. This means that there will undoubtedly be plenty in here you already know, especially in the beginning. When that's the case, simply take it as a refresher. The course was originally intended as simply a collection of every conceivable technique that one could watch again and again to make every technique completely automatic and second nature. Often, as soon as we're on the set, confusion takes over and the blocking becomes reduced to a series of scattered cameras that we hope to stitch together in editing. In order to avoid this blindness at the last minute, we need to not only know every technique, but to know them so well that we can use them without really thinking about it. So after watching the course, it's suggested to watch it over and over, with or without sound, to hammer in techniques until they become automatic. On Volume 1 and 2, we're dealing with stationary blocking, where we'll try to do everything we can without moving the camera. On Volume 3 and 4, we work with a moving camera and develop a comprehensive language of camera moves. On Volume 5 and 6, we develop an effective blocking method that produces excellent results for the vast majority of scenes and put everything to use by staging a lot of scenes. The ultimate goal of this course is to make directing as intuitive and playful as possible, which is ironically best achieved by having extremely strong technique, far beyond what is necessary. The purpose of this course is never to create a rigid or boring set of rules that must be followed, but to get the power that comes from knowing literally every technique in depth. The underlying assumption is that you'll take everything in here and use it how you want. With that said, let's start by running down some basics. During the next number of chapters, we'll go over some basics of composing shots. Starting with shot sizes, the various sizes go by names that are meant to make them easier to communicate. The full shot includes the feet in the frame. The medium full shot is a tighter full shot that crops around the knees. 
The cowboy shot is framed to include a cowboy's gun, a carryover from westerns. The medium shot cuts just below the waist. After this, we have a couple of close shots. First the medium close shot, which cuts just above the waist. And then the close shot, which cuts by the character's breast area. Above this, we have a number of close-ups. First the wide close-up, then the full close-up, then the medium close-up, and finally the extreme close-up. Too much credit is given to these names because they aren't exact and most people don't agree on what they mean or even use the same words. And if the character needs to move, which he usually does, the terms become meaningless. So all shot sizes are sort of. Here we're sort of in a medium close. A quicker and more precise way to communicate shot sizes is to simply walk over to the character and physically show the top and bottom of where the frame should crop. When picking shot sizes, a useful convention is to avoid cropping characters at leg joints. Here we're cutting him off at the knees, which can make him look amputated. So let's crop him in the middle of the thighs. If we need to be any wider, it's better to go to a full shot because cropping him in the middle of the calf tends to make him look like he's standing in something. And the same happens when cropping at the ankles. When we have the choice, this whole area is the least forgiving place to crop and makes sense to avoid. We simply pick shot sizes based on how identified or intimate we want to be with the character. If she's deeply personal and open about her feelings, we don't want to be this wide. And if she's talking about something ordinary, we don't want to be this close unless it has very personal meaning. Being too close can feel severe if we don't know a character because intimacy takes time. In the course of a story, we start out not knowing the characters, so in the beginning we'll lean towards full shots and medium shots, moving on to closer shots. As we gradually get to know the characters, we can better accept going closer without feeling forced. We can then save extreme close-ups for late in a story where our relationship with them has become personal. Moving out from full shots, we become less and less intimate with the character. As she gets smaller in the frame with more space around her, she begins to appear lonely or insignificant. To quickly run down the basic shot types, this is a single shot. This is a two shot. This is a three shot. And so forth. An insert is a close-up on a part of the scene. A POV or point of view is seeing the scene from the character's perspective. The most basic dialogue setup is two matching over the shoulder shots and two matching close-ups in all two cameras on each character. The technical names for these pairs are internal and external reverses because the close-ups are inside the space between the characters and the over-the-shoulders are outside. A normal editing pattern is to cut between the external shots and then at some point as we get deeper into the dialogue to move in and cut between the internal shots. If we want to become less personal again we can go back to the external shots. We can easily have different shot sizes on each character. Here we're more identified with a woman and less with a man. If we turn that around, we're now more identified with a man and less with a woman. Another way to control our level of identification with the characters is with our distance to the eye line. With the camera out here, we're very far away from the eye line and more detached from the dialogue. As the camera gets closer to the eye line, we become more involved. The further we are from the eye line, the more objective and impersonal the shot is. As we get closer to the eye line, we become more involved, saving rubbing against the eye line for very personal scenes. An elegant technique can be to place close ups closer to the eye line than over the shoulders. So, starting in an over the shoulder that's further away from the eye line, as we cut close, we're also moving closer to the eye line and becoming more personal. With several cameras on a character, the shot sizes need to be different enough to avoid a jump cut. Here the cameras are too similar. As we cut from the wide camera to the closer camera, we get a jolt because the shots aren't different enough. So let's make the wide shot wider. 
starting in the wider shot, the cut is smooth because we understand it is a cut. Cutting from shot sizes that are very different can also be jumpy, but doesn't come across as a mistake. Starting in a very wide shot, the cut close is startling, but still makes sense visually. It's fine to place cameras on a character at different angles. But his shot sizes need to be different enough, so do angles. If we're cutting to a camera at only a slightly different angle, we get the same type of jump as before. The rule of thumb is that shot sizes or angles should be at least 20% different, but that's a little on the low end. Master shots have several meanings. The first is a wide shot that records the entire scene. So we'll start the scene in the master, then cut to the external shot on the man, the internal shot on the red woman, and the external shot on the blue woman. The women walk out and we cut back into the master as he remains alone in the room. We can place the master anywhere we want as long as we stay on the same side of the action as the other cameras. But we have potential continuity problems cutting back into a master because the actor's performance has changed during the day, which is easier to hide in closer shots. It's also a waste of film and the actor's energy to shoot masters that we're only going to use at the beginning or end. So instead of shooting long masters, which is the convention, let's treat it as simply another wide shot and concentrate on the part we know we want to use. The second meaning of a master is a camera at a right angle to a reverse shot setup. If a POV is seeing the scene in the first person, an over the shoulder would be seeing it in the second person. A right angle master is then the third person. In editing, much of what we're doing is controlling how we're identifying with the characters. It can be very useful to have a neutral camera that detaches from them both. The third meeting of a master is a carefully choreographed camera that moves through the scene as the action envelops it. In this shot from a later chapter, we push into the scene as characters and extras weave around the camera. Here we're counting on the master being the main and perhaps only coverage for the scene. Shot size comes from either the distance between us and the characters or from the focal length. Focal length, or zoom, is the angle of view. In this oversimplified drawing, light enters the lens and is projected onto a frame of 35mm film. When we zoom in, what we're really doing is moving the lens further away from the film, which narrows the angle of view. So this is called a long lens. A wide angle is created by moving the lens closer, which widens the angle of view. So this is called a short lens. If we're fairly close to the character with a short lens, we can produce the same shot size by setting up the camera further back and using a longer lens. As we cut between these two cameras, the shot size is identical, but the perspective is very different. Focal length makes an enormous difference in the relative sizes of characters or objects. Here we're in a regular over the shoulder, but as we pull back and zoom in, the perspective becomes much flatter and the characters seem to have the same size. This is called compression of space and is as fundamental a choice as shot size. In the closer shot with a wide lens, the distance between the characters is the same as the distance from the red man to the camera. But with a camera further back and a longer lens, the distance between the characters is only a fraction of the distance to the camera. So in comparison to the distance to the camera, the distance between the characters is almost nothing. The first thing focal length does is control the closeness between the characters. This is a sliding scale. If we zoom out and move closer, the characters seem further apart. If we move far back and zoom in, the characters seem closer together. Secondly, it allows us to see the world in a different way than the human eye does. If we want a shot to look like reality, we'll use a lens that has the same angle of view as the human eye, which on 35mm film is around 50mm. But we make shots much more interesting by deliberately staying away from lenses that mimic the human eye. Here we're using a 25mm lens, which creates more distance between everything in the scene and the illusion of a larger location. Here we're using a 120mm lens, which creates a tighter atmosphere and singles out the characters we're interested in. 
Being wider or longer than reality is the easiest way to create